Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Homes at Home, where we explore the Great Lakes from the comfort of our home. My name is Megan Goss, and I work for Michigan State University Extension and Michigan Sea Grant in the Saginaw Bay region of Michigan. And today, our topic is Great Lakes Invaders, where we'll learn all about non-native and invasive species in the Great Lakes. Before we dive into that topic, let's introduce our homes. So as a reminder for new viewers joining us, HOMES is an acronym for our Great Lakes and it helps us to remember our different Great Lakes. So today we'll be introducing our homes using the HOMES acronym as a refresher. So be sure to shout out the answers at home. So our first Great Lake begins with the letter H. Any guesses? It's Huron, Lake Huron. That's the Great Lake closest to me. Next we have O. Which lake begins with the letter O? Ontario, Lake Ontario. Next, we have M. Any guesses? Lake Michigan. And we also have letter E. Any guesses at home? Lake Erie. And last but not least, S. Lake Superior. Yes, yeah, so those are our five Great Lakes that make up our homes, which serve as the largest surface freshwater system on this planet. So as I mentioned earlier, today's topic is Great Lakes invaders. And in the Great Lakes Basin, um, since the early um, 1800s, many non-native species have been introduced to the Great Lakes. These non-native species can include plants, animals, and microscopic organisms. So things that you'll need a microscope to see. And they may be released in the Great Lakes accidentally or intentionally, or on purpose. And there are more than 180 non-native species found in the Great Lakes today. Now, you might be wondering what these different terms are. A non-native, a native, an invasive. So let's dive in to these topics and explain these terms a little bit more. So a native species is something that normally lives in a particular ecosystem, meaning that they developed with the surrounding habitat. Behind me here, this is not an example of a native species in the Great Lakes. Um, a non-native species in comparison is a species that's not from the area um, and it was introduced, but it's not seen to cause harm. An example of a non-native species in the Great Lakes is the Chinook salmon. And they were introduced in the Great Lakes to combat another invasive species, alewives. And they now contribute to our sports fishery in the Great Lakes. In comparison to a non-native species, an invasive species is something that's not from that area and it causes some kind of harm. So, in this picture behind me, this is an invasive species in the Great Lakes Basin. This is invasive Phragmites. It can cause ecological harm, economic harm, and social harm. So behind me here, you can see how invasive species can grow in really thick monocultures which means that there's only one type of plant in that area. So in this photo behind me, you can see there's a lot of Phragmites growing in a really dense area and it doesn't allow for other plants to survive. And it also doesn't provide a lot of good habitat for our waterfowl and other nesting birds and coastal wetlands. And some invasive species can be really aggressive, thinking about rusty crayfish, and they can take over habitat and other food sources. They can also prey on other native species. Uh, there can also be a big biodiversity loss. As we learned in last week's Homes at Home, our invasive species can impact our biodiversity, which is really important for the health of the Great Lakes. And biodiversity is just all the different forms of life that can be found in an area. Um, it can also, invasive species can also cause an economic impact. 
they cost, it costs a lot of money to manage invasive species. So from researchers from the University of Notre Dame, they found that for damages caused um, by invasive species, it can cost about $138 million annually in damages. So that's not even the cost to manage the invasive species. That's just the impact of damages that they can have on the Great Lakes Basin. Other non-native species that have come from ships, they cost the Great Lakes region about $200 million to control. So ballast water is one way that invasive species have been introduced in the Great Lakes. And we'll learn more about that um, in an upcoming video, but also our different ways that we can transport invasive species in our local area. Before we dive in to the way that they can impact, let's learn a little bit more about invasive species. I mentioned ballast water, and you might know this aquatic invader next to me. This is zebra mussel. It's an image, and here you can see another picture of a zebra and quagga mussel. And these invasive species were introduced by ballast water brought by freighters from Eastern Europe that traveled across the Atlantic Ocean um, to the Great Lakes. And when they arrived, they released ballast water from the ships. Now, ballast water is a helpful way to manage weight on boats, when traveling from different marine environments to aquatic environments. So thinking about on the ocean, that's salt water, which can cause boats to be more buoyant, which means they might need a little bit more weight to stay afloat. And by buoyant, I mean that it can cause things to float. When those vessels go onto in, on the ocean, they add more water as weight to the vessel. Now, when they get to the Great Lakes, those vessels are now no longer in a saltwater environment. So if they keep that added weight in the water in their boat, it can cause the boat to sink. So they have to find some way to release that water safely. And prior to some important legislation to manage our ballast water, uh, there were mussels like the quagga and zebra mussels that were introduced by ballast water into the Great Lakes. So they traveled all the way from Eastern Europe to our Great Lakes and were released in that water. And then once in the Great Lakes, they've had a really big impact on our food web. So these mussels, they are filter feeders and they can grow to be about two inches long, but each mussel can filter about a liter of water a day. And while they filter that water, they eat plankton, which is an important food source for fish in our Great Lakes. These mussels can also clog water intake pipes and impact the ability for water to flow easily. And those water intake pipes are really important because they serve as a way for us to get fresh water from our Great Lakes for drinking. And it costs a lot of money to manage these invasive species. Another invasive species you may be familiar with is this one next to me now. Has anyone seen this invasive species before? This is a sea lamprey. So sea lamprey were introduced in the Great Lakes when we changed St. Lawrence Seaway and opened up passage for boats to be able to travel into the Great Lakes and open up the Great Lakes for commerce. With sea lamprey, they can have a really big impact on our fishery in the Great Lakes. They first invaded in Lake Ontario when uh, we changed around the St. Lawrence uh, River in the 1800s. And then as we've changed around the Great Lakes basin and increased connections from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie, we've been able to let these invasive fish spread. So sea lamprey are an example of an invasive fish that is a parasite. So it uses that mouth to attach onto other larger fish and it can suck their nutrients from them. One sea lamprey can kill about a 40 pounds of Great Lakes fish in its lifetime. So thinking about all that tasty lake trout, this species can have a really big impact on them. And uh, we've seen that from our commercial fishery. And there are a lot of partners that are working to manage this invasive species across the Great Lakes Basin because we want to protect our uh, Great Lakes fishery as much as we can. Another example of an invasive species is this pretty flower next to me. Does anyone have any guesses what it is at home? It's purple loosestrife. 
So purple loosestrife is an example of a pretty plant that was introduced. Um, it is native to Europe and Asia, and it arrived in North America as early as the 1800s. It's believed it was brought for, by settlers for their gardens, and this is an example of an invasive species that was planted for its beauty. But it's really important to not spread this invasive species. Like other invasive plants, it can be very aggressive and grow in these thick monocultures. Just like that invasive Phragmites, it can make it harder for other native plants to thrive. And it invades wetlands and other moist soil areas and can disrupt the biodiversity found in those areas. Each plant, so one plant, can produce over a million seeds a year. So this can be a helpful way for seeing how these invasive species can spread because they're not from that area, but some have characteristics like this purple loose strife, which makes it easier for them to spread across in different areas. So now that we've learned a little bit more about the impact of invasive species that they can have, let's learn more about how we can stop their spread. We'll be learning about ways to stop their spread by a partner video uh, from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. So let's share our video. Hello, my name is Tom Owen, and welcome to another video in the Invasive Species series. Today we'll be talking about how invasive species spread, and I'll be giving you some information on what you can do to ensure that you are not spreading invasive species. Invasive species impact every resident in Michigan to some degree, and it is important for everyone who uses or appreciates Michigan's great outdoors to do their part to reduce the spread of invasive species. By now, you understand the destruction invasive species can cause when introduced into an environment. Let's explore in more detail how they're introduced into new environments. Take a look here. This is the spread of zebra mussels from 1986 to 2014. The methods species used to move and spread are referred to as pathways. The large geographic jumps zebra mussels made across the nation are likely due to hitchhiking on boats. Invasive species can spread using the same methods that native species use. They use immigration, they can use wind dispersal, or they can attach to other animals, known as hitchhiking. Aquatic species use hydrologic connections to move around, including flowing rivers, streams, and more. But most importantly, people move invasive species around, whether they mean to or not. Invasive species can be spread by misplaced good intention too. Examples include a neighbor sharing a shrub that grew well in their yard, or someone releasing live pets or bait into the environment, thinking that it's the humane thing to do. These good intentions could actually be introducing an invasive species. This can be especially harmful if the animal or plant has a competitive advantage over native species. This includes animals used in classroom studies, pets and garden plants, and live fishing bait. An excellent example of what can happen comes out of Wisconsin. In 2009, red swamp crayfish were discovered in two ponds near Milwaukee. It took five years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to eradicate them. While the source of the crayfish is unknown, it's believed that they either escaped or were released. Many of the pathways for invasive species to spread are directly connected to human activities. If you love camping or spending time by a bonfire, it's important that you use firewood from a local source. Here is a photo from P.J. Hoffmaster State Park on the Lake Michigan shoreline after approximately 200 oak trees had to be cut down due to oak wilt, an invasive tree disease. The disease likely came to the park on firewood brought in from another region by campers. When you leave a site, take a moment to inspect all of your gear, clothing, and pets. Look for seeds, dirt, and mud, any plant material, standing water, and live animals. If you find anything, clean it off before you leave the site. It could be an invasive species. In this video, we've learned that invasive species use numerous pathways to get to new environments, and that preventing those introductions is essential. To learn more about invasive species, please visit michigan.gov slash invasive species. The site provides information on invasive species specific to Michigan. There you can also learn about laws, permitting, grants, volunteer opportunities, and more. So remember, even if an invasive species is widespread, it doesn't mean that it's everywhere. So please take care to ensure that you're not moving invasive species. Thanks for watching. 
So thanks to our partners for uh, that great video that's highlighted the different pathways for invasive species to spread. Um, so to reiterate some of those pathways, we wanted to highlight uh, ways that you all can stop the spread of invasive species. So from play, clean, go, you can stop invasive species in their tracks by removing plants, animals, and mud from boots, gear, pets, and your vehicle. You should clean your gear before entering and when leaving a recreation site. And when visiting um, different natural areas, be sure to stay on designated roads and trails. And then, like in the video, be sure to use certified or local firewood or hay. In addition to invasive species that can spread on land, there are also aquatic hitchhikers that can spread in our water sources. Um, and you can take a uh, pledge to stop these aquatic hitchhikers. Um, and ways that you can stop the spread is by cleaning all watercraft and equipment. This watercraft can include canoes, kayaks, motorboats, stand-up paddle boards. It's important to remove visible aquatic plants and mud before leaving the water access site. Um, you also need to drain water from the boat, bilge, motor, and live well by removing the drain plug. This is really important when thinking about ballast water and how water can transport aquatic hitchhikers, thinking about what we learned about the impacts of ze zebra and quagga mussels. It's also important to dry everything at least five days before going to another body of water. If you need to recreate before then, be sure to spray and rinse your equipment with high pressure water um, and or hot water if possible. You can also reduce invasive species by not releasing pets or animals into the waterways. With the reduce invasive species pet and plant escapes or ripple, you can learn why it's important um, to never release plants and animals from aquariums into streams and rivers. If you do have an unwanted animal or plant, reach out to a friend or local aquarium or zoo to see if they would like it. You can also contact your vet veterinarian um, or a plant store or a pet or plant store for your proper disposal tips. Now you might be wondering, is this really that big of a deal? Well, here's a photo of a goldfish that was released into fresh water. And goldfish, when released um, out of aquariums, can grow to be very large sizes. For instance, at last year's Saginaw Bay 4-H Fish Camp, we had a partner that brought in a goldfish that is found at the um, inland lake by his house. When his nephew was um, about five years old, he decided to release a goldfish into the nearby pond. And that pond was really great um, for other types of bluegill and great fishing for that. But now it's mainly a goldfish lake. So those goldfish have taken over the habitat and they brought in that goldfish to show why it's important to never release pets from your aquarium. You can also contribute data and help us better understand invasive species by reporting them with the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. This is a collaboration across multiple states where you can map invasive species because early detection is really important. As we learned, it costs a lot of money to manage invasive species. So if we can find them early, we can help prevent their spread and manage them when it's easier. Um, and the MISSIN database has both a web platform you can use and a desktop app. There's also the GLANSIS um, a database, which is the Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System. This is the way that um, our partners from NOAA and the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab um, collect data across the Great Lakes Basin to see how these non-native species are impacting the basin. You can um, see more and learn more about the impact of Great Lakes invasive species by visiting the GLANSIS website. And as we learned in last week's Homes at Homes, you can also use iNaturalist to map invasive species. Um, and as part of our Great Lakes BioBlitz Challenge, there was a special week that was featured calling out to collect data on invasive species. So this is definitely a helpful tool you can use to help us better understand 
where invasive species are found. If you really enjoyed this topic, there's a great way that you can learn more about invasive species through Making Waves, Battle for the Great Lakes. This documentary is available for free to rent online today, April 21st, and tomorrow, April 22nd, which is Earth Day, and you can access this two-part series for free by using the promo code Earth Day. Now, if you're not sure if you want to check out this video, I'll show you a cool trailer that'll help you see why this documentary is something really cool and worth checking out. In the heart of North America lies the world's largest freshwater ecosystem, the Great Lakes. Over thousands of years, the lakes developed a rich and unique ecosystem. But within decades of settling their shores, we began to destroy it. Deforestation, pollutants, and overfishing have taken their toll. But biological pollution through invasive species could be the worst threat to the lakes yet. People stand on the bluffs overlooking the lake and it looks gorgeous, and it is gorgeous. But what's going on underneath the surface is a totally different show. It happened with lightning speed and caught everybody off guard. Not only are they throughout the system and affecting every habitat, they're self-perpetuating. We can't turn them off like we can turn off some of the chemicals. Yeah, many of them are below the radar. People don't even really know they're there, even though they're having a huge impact on the ecosystems of the Great Lakes. It's drastic. It's changed the way the lakes function. Follow scientists and researchers as they fight to prevent a biological takeover in the battle for the Great Lakes. Wow, that's a great documentary. And if you haven't been able to check it out yet, I definitely recommend you tune in today or tomorrow and use the Earth Day promo code. This video is also available at any time by visiting Making Waves, but there will be a rental fee. Now, it's time to announce our challenge. So today's challenge for our Homes at Home series is first and foremost, stop the spread of invasive species. As we learned from the tips of ways to stop the spread of invasive species, there's a lot of steps that we can take to better protect the Great Lakes. Our challenge today and tomorrow and every day in the future is to stop the spread of invasive species by making sure you clean any of your gear when moving from place to place. So thinking about seeds and other mud that might be on your boots, tent, vehicle, and then also making sure you clean, drain, and dry any of your uh, vessels that might be traveling from uh, one water body to another. In addition to stopping the spread of invasive species, it's also important for us to learn more about them. With NAB the Aquatic Invader, this fun uh, interactive website, you can learn more about different suspects and learn more about these most wanted invaders and ways that we can um, stop them. So try to find one species that you would like to learn more about. Um, you can also tune in to the Making Waves, Battle for the Great Lakes. Again, it's available for free today and tomorrow because of Earth Day uh, with the promo code Earth Day. And then there's also um, the Invasive Species Coloring Book, which can be a fun way to explore and learn more about invasive species through the use of art. Again, you can use the different databases to explore invasive species in your local area. So with that, I thank you all for joining and learning more about invasive species here in the Great Lakes. And now I'm happy to take any questions that you might have related to Great Lakes invasive species. Hi everyone, my name is Cindy and I work with Megan at Michigan Sea Grant and I'm in my home in Lansing. We've gotten a couple of questions in already that I wanna share with Megan. One is, what invasive species has hurt the Great Lakes the most, Megan? Well, there have um, been a number of different impacts. So I think it's, it's hard to catalog what um, those uh, different impacts can be. It just really depends on um, the 
focus that you're looking on. Um, and I want to note that I am not necessarily an expert in this. I do uh, think that the um, impact of the zebra and quagga mussels has been very far reaching, um, thinking about the impacts that it had on the food web um, and then the impacts that it uh, had on uh, fish, thinking about uh, different types of impacts that it had on uh, the access to plankton in the food web, and then also thinking about water intake pipes and how it clogged those pipes. And it costs a lot of money to manage. But there's also other invasive species like Phragmites, which caused a lot of money to manage as well. So I think it's important um, just to think about it collectively as it's not just one invasive species that's causing an impact. It's a lot of them that are causing an impact and that impact can be varied depending on where you are and um, what can be found in that local area. Yeah, that's a really good point. Are there any invasive species that have been completely removed from the Great Lakes? It's really difficult to completely remove an invasive species once it's been established. Um, I th there are examples of invasive species that have, um, over time, uh, they're still considered invasive, but they aren't considered to have as much of, um, they aren't considered to have as, I guess they've, they've been a custom over time. So thinking about earthworms, for instance, those are actually an invasive species and they do have a big impact, um, but they're not native to North America. So that is one example of a species that has been here for a long time, um, but you don't necessarily think of it as invasive. So I think it's more of their uh, context changes, but it's not necessarily that you're gonna eradicate them completely once they become established. And I also think that uh, sea lamprey has been one of our success stories in the Great Lakes because while we haven't gotten rid of sea lamprey, through the efforts, a lot of efforts of a lot of people, we've controlled the sea lamprey so they aren't devastating the fish species as much. Definitely. And that is um, a big part of the management. It's not completely removing a species, it's managing the impact and helping to lower that impact. So the, the management strategies for sea lamprey is an excellent example of that. I think we've got time for just one more question. And are Asian carp considered an invasive species? Yes, they are. And that is one that you want to be on the lookout and stopping Asian carp from entering into the Great Lakes. And there are um, different species of Asian carp. So um, the two that are of most concern are um, the big head Asian carp and then the silver Asian carp. So um, the big head, they can eat a lot of food. Um, and thinking about the impact that that could have on our food webs in the Great Lakes, we're um, really hoping to keep that um, type of fish out of the Great Lakes. Um, and then silver carp, um, you may have seen videos of them, and it was actually included in the Making Waves Battle for the Great Lakes, but that is the fish that when it hears the vibrations of motors from boats, it can actually jump up into the air, and that can cause hazards for boaters. So thinking about if you enjoy going out fishing, is it going to be that enjoyable when you have a fish that can jump two to three feet up in the air? And it can even um, cause impacts thinking about hitting people in the head and the hazards that it can have out on those waterways. So it's definitely something that we need to keep out of the Great Lakes. And there's a lot of um, groups that are working together, both at the state, federal, and um, in international collaboration, thinking about working across the United States and Canada to control and stop um, a Asian carp from entering the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River Basin. Wow, thank you, Megan. It's really uh, interesting to learn about all the things that people are doing. Remember, we're going to be here again on Thursday, same time, same link with our Homes at Homes, and also next week, and we're going to continue to learn about the Great Lakes. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, you can find them at our Michigan Sea Grant website at www.michiganseagrant.org. And don't forget, tomorrow is Earth Day. Um, there's so many exciting things that are happening to celebrate Earth Day, even though we can't go out and do some of our trash pickups 
uh, as a group, we could always do those on our own, in our own walks or in our own neighborhoods. And please be sure, take an opportunity to watch that Making Waves movie. It's fantastic. So thanks again. Please be sure to come back on Thursday. Bye-bye. Can't wait to see you then. Bye.